It's April 2022 in Silicon Roundabout, London's East End tech district. Inside the offices of a cryptocurrency startup called Aztec Network, John Wu is flicking through a few job applications. Aztec Network is hiring aggressively, especially for great engineering talent as we build out our network. John's about to interview a job applicant on a video call, so he steps into a private booth so that he won't disturb his colleagues. The candidate's name is Bobby Sierra. And along with his resume, Bobby has submitted a cover letter. And this cover letter was generally unexceptional, but it had a very unique sign-off. And the sign-off was, the world will see a great result from my hands, which I thought was just very Bond villain-esque. It was really almost comical in how villainous it sounded. You know, you could imagine that being followed up with like a cackle or something. John's thinking, bit weird, but okay, let's meet the guy. And I initiated the call and kind of the first red flag was he didn't turn his camera on. It was also just really hard to hear Bobby. He was calling from somewhere incredibly noisy. Which, you know, again, is highly unprofessional. And what I noticed was it sounded not like he was at a cafe, but like he was in a call center. Like there were three or four other people in there also making calls or doing interviews. And so I asked him about that and he kind of began this very interesting dance where he would mute in order to hide the background noise, but he wasn't really clear when to unmute. And so we had these long silences where I'd ask him a question, he would stay muted, I would ask him to unmute, then he would stay unmuted, I'd ask him to mute again. And so it was kind of just this hilarious little dance that we were doing. When you asked the questions, what kind of answers was Bobby Sierra giving? He, he gave some extraordinarily generic answers. Things like, he would say, I'm a successful blockchain engineer. I uh, will make you very successful. But some really glaring inconsistencies started coming up. His resume said he was based in Canada. When I asked him where he was based, he said he was based in Hong Kong. I asked him how long he had been in Hong Kong. He had a lot of trouble uh, explaining that. John is from New York and says he knew a lot of Koreans growing up, and he thinks he detects a Korean accent in the stilted English that this mysterious Bobby Sierra is using. And so that started to make the hairs in the back of my neck stand up a little bit because I had been aware of some of Lazarus Group's activities, and I started to say, mm, there's enough of these red flags piling up that there might be something more nefarious going on. And I felt uncomfortable enough at that point that I disconnected. John's about to find out that he had a pretty good reason to be suspicious. It seems the North Korean regime is trying to worm its way into the international cryptocurrency industry. Thanks to the crypto boom, there's a mind-boggling amount of money sloshing through this new world of finance. And that has caught the eye of North Korea's elite hackers, the Lazarus Group. From the BBC World Service, this is The Lazarus Heist, Season 2. I'm Jean Lee. And I'm Jeff White. Episode 8, Bitcoin Bandits. After his suspicious encounter with Bobby Sierra, John Wu hangs up the call, feeling stunned. I'll never forget, I opened the door to our office in London and I just kind of announced the room. I think I just interviewed a North Korean hacker. <laughs> right. And what was the reaction from the room? I mean, shock, of course. And yeah, I think everyone was both highly entertained and a little nervous to be like, man, we didn't think we were high enough profile for someone to try to gain entry or we didn't think that we'd be a target. And I think that's kind of what victims always think, right? Little old me, why would someone come after us? Just to finish off the story, by the way, did like, you didn't offer Bobby Sierra the job then in the end? No, unfortunately, he didn't get the job. John can't be sure that Bobby Sierra is North Korean. He's got no way of actually knowing, but he just has this hunch about it. He can't figure out what a North Korean hacker would hope to gain by applying for a job at his company. Then, about two weeks after interviewing Bobby, John finds out that the US government has issued a special report warning the tech industry to watch out for North Koreans applying for jobs. The way that North Korea does it, and this is the way the US Treasury explains, is that there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of overseas North Korean IT workers who pose as Western or foreign nationals in order to get hired 
for general tech companies. And of course, because of the global shortage of tech talent, these people get hired and they get hired at salaries much, much higher than they could earn domestically in North Korea. The North Korean government custodies whatever money they make as their wage, pays them out some tiny, tiny proportion, and then keeps the rest to fund North Korean WMD operations. And when I read this, I was immediately taken back to this interview. It felt very vindicating. The crypto community was totally thrown by the revelations in this US report. It said that although many of these North Korean job applicants may not be hackers themselves, they sometimes work closely with North Koreans who are. And some of them had already used the privileged access they'd gained after being hired by a company to enable cyber intrusions. John's company facilitates cryptocurrency payments. And that means that at any one time, the company has control over large sums of its customers' money. So it's entirely possible that Bobby planned to help North Korea's hacker thieves rob the company from the inside. Scarier still, if Bobby had been hired, he could have been tasked with designing software to keep the company's systems secure from hackers, which would have been pretty ironic. You could, in many hundreds or thousands of lines of code, put in a critical vulnerability that only you knew about and that would be hard to find. And so a North Korean supply chain attacker could keep that to himself and then at the right moment, attack the known vulnerability and extract funds. John decided to take to social media to share his story. He was immediately flooded with responses. A lot of people had the same experience as me, uh, interviewing potential North Korean IT workers. But the craziest story that I heard was I was at a co-working space here in Brooklyn and I ran into a friend of a friend and he said, hey John, I read your Twitter thread and did you know we had a North Korean on our payroll for six months? What? And I said, how is that possible? And he said, well, we hired someone. They obviously operate under a pseudonym. And it wasn't until the FBI called us and said, we have tracked your funds to a North Korean account. Oh, God. Did we realize that we needed to do a deep security review and identify every single person working for us? And he said, this person was our best engineer. He was a member of our team. He was contributing a lot. And he was frankly sad to have lost this guy. And I'm sure the North Korean was sad to have lost the job. Remember, by this time, UN member nations were supposed to have rescinded all work visas for North Koreans. But U.S. authorities believe thousands of North Korean IT workers still remain abroad in China, Russia, Africa, and Southeast Asia. And that salary that John was offering is far more than the few hundred U.S. dollars a month they might make back home. It's fascinating to get this glimpse of a person from North Korea figuring out not just the tech skills, but also the people skills required to pull something like this off. Imagine having to stay in character, pretending to be of a different nationality, with a totally different backstory, for six months. And it's this kind of criminal espionage that the U.S. government is warning tech companies to be wary of. So clearly, this story could be one of many. How do you feel about this in hindsight, then? I mean, sitting from where you are now, what, what's your overriding feeling? It all feels a little surreal, you know? It, even just the statement, some cryptocurrency employees are funneling their wages back to nuclear weapons programs, even that just sounds completely absurd to say. Yeah, in general, it makes me much more skeptical and paranoid about kind of not knowing where funds and code are coming from. All through the making of this podcast, Gene and I have been desperately wanting to speak to someone involved in North Korea's secretive hacking program. And John Wu might have done just that without even trying. It's entirely possible that Bobby Sierra, if he's really North Korean, knows North Korean hackers, went to school with them, and maybe even lives with them in a dorm overseas. And when I was speaking to John, hearing all about Bobby, I was itching to speak to him myself. So I asked John for Bobby's contact details, and he gave me the ID he was using on Telegram, a secure messaging app. So I thought, what the heck, let's give him a call. Now, I'll be honest, I was pretty sure this wouldn't work. Surely, Bobby wouldn't be using this Telegram user ID anymore. It was a classic investigative journalist wild goose chase. But then... Oh my gosh, it's ringing. 
Now, safety first, I made this call from a burner phone, not connected to any of my real numbers or email accounts, so I wasn't risking any personal information if the phone got hacked. My call just rang and rang. I hung up. No goose for me. But then, Bobby started typing. Here he is. Hi, this is Bobby uh, on Telegram. So I'm going to send him a message and ask if he wants to talk. Can we talk? Do you have any projects for me? <laughs> this is astonishing. Clearly, Bobby is still looking for work from this account. Next, he asked me to send him my LinkedIn profile, which was a bit hair-raising because LinkedIn is one of the ways the Lazarus Group target their victims. But by this point, he knew my name, so I sent him my profile and a link to the Lazarus Heist podcast for good measure. Nice, says Bobby Sierra, followed by cool. He's had a look at my LinkedIn profile and he thinks it's nice and cool. What do you want? Well, that's the crux, isn't it? I co-present a BBC podcast about North Korean hackers. I put our question to Bobby. Are you working for North Korea? Can I ask for your thoughts? Hmm. No answer. This is where Bobby stopped texting back. I tried one more call, but he ghosted me. I heard nothing more from him. So close, and yet so far. And look, that shouldn't come as a surprise. I mean, I had to tell him who I was, but I knew that risked scaring him off. So I didn't get the interview I wanted, but I did find out something fascinating. Apparently, North Korea's IT workers have become so brazen, so keen to break into crypto companies, that it seems they're hanging out on Telegram, where we can chat to them. Their drive to make money has become so ravenous, they're increasingly having to come out of the shadows. And their tactics for breaking into crypto go well beyond trying their luck applying for developer jobs. They've had their sights on the world's crypto wallets for a while now. And in the middle of the night in September 2020, this was about to spell very bad news for one major cryptocurrency company. They say money never sleeps. That's the old Wall Street mantra. Finance is a 24-7 business and long hours come with the job. But surely there are limits. About 4 a.m. in the morning, Singapore time, I was awakened by a call and surprisingly it was one of our co-founders. In that call, he didn't talk much. He just said, OK, something happened. We need you to come to the office immediately. This is Jing Chang. Back in September 2020, when he received this painfully early wake-up call, he was working for a cryptocurrency company called Qcoin. Their head office is in Singapore, overlooking Marina Bay. That's the waterfront with all those futuristic hotels with rooftop bars and infinity pools. And Qcoin sounds like one of those work hard, play hard kind of places. If you want, you can go to the gym in the office to have some exercises. Then there are also some like gaming machines if you want to take a rest. What, what gaming machines have you got, I've got to ask? It's some like um, computer games back in the 80s or 90s. I make boom! The very old machines. You can put the coins inside and play some old-fashioned games. Seems like a job with some pretty fun perks, but it doesn't sound like Ching's being called in at 4 a.m. by his bosses just to duke it out over a game of Street Fighter. You lose! Qcoin is a crypto exchange. You can sign up online and set up a digital wallet with Qcoin. It's basically a kind of bank account for crypto. Then you can use your dollars and pounds to buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ether, plus a whole range of other crypto assets, as they're called, things like NFTs, non-fungible tokens, for example. In terms of the trading volume, for instance, currently uh, the average daily volume on Qcoin is about 5 billion every day. Sorry, 5 billion? Dollars yeah. is that? Yeah, tool? US dollars. Wow. Yeah. Five billion dollars is a huge amount of money. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Kucoin is one of the top five crypto exchanges in terms of like the overall performance. That kind of turnover makes Qcoin an attractive target. And that's exactly what Jing's worrying about as he rushes into the office. But on the taxi, I, I was thinking like what kind of things may happen uh, so that I have to go to the office now. It must be something really bad. And for crypto exchanges, the worst thing that could happen would be like security incident, like a hack. When I arrived at the office, I saw most of the co-founders, 
they were already there. So I was thinking it must be something really bad because just like when you watch a like Marvel movie, where all the superheroes are gathering, you will know the situation is very, very, very tough to deal with, right? That's when I know, okay, it, it was a hack actually. Qcoin had been quick off the mark spotting the attack. It began at 3 a.m. Singapore time, an hour before Jing gets called in. And when he arrives, the emergency response is in full flow. The company's security team are watching a bunch of abnormal transactions on the system. The company's wallets are being systematically emptied of all their crypto assets, the Bitcoin, the Ether, and everything else. Someone, somewhere, is trying to bleed the firm dry. Security staff are frantically transferring the remaining funds out of wallets that have been hacked and into secure ones that they hope are going to be beyond the hacker's reach. It's like a race with the attackers because at the same time the attackers are still trying to get more funds out of the platform. The security team are gradually winning. By the time Jing reaches the office, they've moved most of their funds to safe havens. But when the dust settles, they add up what was stolen. And it's a lot. Close to 300 million US dollars of Bitcoin, Ether, and other crypto assets gone in minutes. As the sun's rising over Marina Bay in Singapore, Jing is focusing on how to break the news to Qcoin's customers. Jing works on the marketing team, so it's his job to help the company get the message out to their account holders that some of their funds may have been stolen. And he's going to have to do that pretty quickly because customers have already figured out that something's up. When I arrived at the office, there were already some rumors out there saying that, OK, something wrong with KuCoins. And also, we have a huge community on Telegram and Twitter. They have started to panic. How did they know? Well, it's partly because of how these cryptocurrencies work. Every time you use one, like buying something with Bitcoin, the transaction is written onto a publicly available online record called a blockchain. This is fundamental to how these cryptocurrencies work. Every currency's got its own blockchain, so it's not gone unnoticed by Qcoin's users watching all this blockchain activity that someone's making giant transfers out of Qcoin's wallets. By this point in 2020, Crypto exchanges had become a favorite target of hacking gangs around the world. There had been dozens of incidents like this. But what's happened to Qcoin is major. It's an eye-watering sum. So Jing rushes to get a company announcement up online saying, yes, Qcoin has been raided. An investigation is underway. Please bear with us. As for that internal investigation, the first question is, how could this have happened? Well, Qcoin have never disclosed any details of exactly how the hackers got in, but we know that once they were inside, the hackers got hold of what's called the private keys to Qcoin's wallets, basically the passwords that unlock them. After that, it's playtime. So that's the how figured out. As for who did it, and more urgently where the funds have gone, Qcoin quickly calls in some help from the big guns. They send a message to one of the world's top crypto investigators, someone on the other side of the world, in Washington, D.C. Where it's the middle of a sunny afternoon. So, was at a family picnic, and I got a message that there's been close to $300 million stolen from an exchange. So, I, I sit down in the grass, <laughs> I pull out my phone, and start to look at it, you can start to piece it together, and you can see the funds flow real time as they're moving, and you just start chasing them. This is Erin Plant, Vice President of Investigations at Chainalysis. That's one of the world's leading crypto tracing firms. Just like banks have forensic investigators who track money down, Chainalysis does the same with crypto, using those publicly available blockchain records. Erin and her colleagues help law enforcement trace the illicit crypto funds of some of the world's worst criminals. We care about wallets that are controlled by terrorists, wallets controlled by child abuse offenders, wallets that are controlled by sanctioned individuals. This is amazing work, and it's helped police around the world put some really terrible people in prison. Not all superheroes wear capes, and it can be hard for Erin to explain to her friends and family exactly what it is she does all day. Everyone says, you do what? <laughs> I thought you, <laughs> I thought you fixed printers. <laughs> Nobody really understands cryptocurrency, so. <laughs> 
and it's this nonplussed response she's dealing with at the family picnic in her local park when she gets the message from KuCoin. Erin opens up some Chainalysis software on her phone that allows her to trace the movement of cryptocurrency in real time. When some major event happens, we jump right in. There's a lot of scrambling because you want to stop the movement of funds as quickly as possible so that you have a chance of getting them back. Were the other guests a bit a bit bemused by this? Did you have to explain, by the way, I'm chasing $300 million and yes, I will have another sandwich? Exactly. That's exactly what happens. And I've got two kids and they were running around and they try to grab at your phone because they want to watch Peppa Pig on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and you're snatching it back. I'm chasing $300 million. <laughs> you might be thinking, if you manage to steal a huge amount of cryptocurrency, surely the first thing you want to do is to convert it into dollars or pounds or any other regular currency. Well, yes, that is the end goal here. It's called cashing out. But it's actually pretty difficult. There are only a few crypto exchanges in the world where massive trades like this are possible and most of them are reputable. They're not in the business of enabling crooks, so they'll be on the lookout for suspiciously large trades that could be the stolen Qcoin funds. So this makes cashing out pretty darn hard, but not impossible. If they're stolen by a sophisticated hacker, which in the instance Qcoin most definitely was, they follow a very complex laundering path. In the moments after the hackers took control of Qcoin's crypto wallets, they began moving the funds through hundreds and hundreds of other wallets. Each wallet's got an address, a string of letters and numbers. It functions a little bit like a bank account number. Using her crypto tracing software, Erin can see the funds shooting from one address to another. The hackers have automated this process, so it's all happening at lightning speed. There's a lot of adrenaline and a lot of excitement. It's a little bit of a police chase where you're, you're trying to follow the car that's flying down the highway trying to catch it while it's making, you know, deviations off of the off ramps and through tunnels and it's all digital. So it's all happening immediately in real time. But as the hackers send their funds careening around the digital highways and back alleys of the crypto world, they're going to need more than speed to shake off Erin and her colleagues. So they also try swapping the stolen funds into different cryptocurrencies, just as you might convert stolen dollars into euros or pounds to make it harder for tracers to keep track. It's like the hackers are changing the license plate on the getaway car and slapping on a new paint job. But Erin's tracking software is pretty sophisticated. These swaps aren't going to be enough to throw her off the scent. And the hackers likely know this, so they step it up a gear and pull a trick which makes all that swapping look like a picnic. And Erin, who's actually at a real picnic, is watching as the hackers send the stolen funds into something called a cryptocurrency mixer. Mixers are, are really popular laundering technique, which are, if you think about it, if you put a bunch of dollar bills on the table and you just sort of, you know, flail them all around with your hands and they all mix together, then you take out a dollar. You don't know if the dollar you put in is the same one you take out. Let's explain a bit more. Imagine I've stolen some Bitcoin. I know investigators are hunting for them, trying to get them back. So for a fee, I put my coins into an online mixer service where they're jumbled together with other people's coins. Now, not everyone using this mixer service is necessarily a crook. The appeal of crypto for a lot of people is anonymity. So a dissident group in a repressive country might use a mixer to hide their funds, for example. But let's say I am a hacker. The mixer runs a program that randomly shuffles all my stolen coins with a bunch of other coins, jumbling up the dirty ones with the clean ones. And then it issues me a new crypto wallet containing the same amount of crypto that I put into the mixer, but not the stolen ones that I threw into the pile. Mixers make it really hard for Erin to keep up. She can see the hackers moving stolen Qcoin funds into mixer services with names like Chip Mixer and Tornado Cash, but it becomes much, much harder for her to establish which of the many payments coming out of these mixer wallets is going to the Qcoin crooks. And the Qcoin hackers can repeat this process as many times as they want. Every time they hit a mixer, it's that much harder to trace. You need really advanced capabilities and software. It's not an easy process. <laughs> can you not contact them and say, by the way, don't, don't shuffle that money around, that's stolen money? Are they receptive to those calls? They tend to not be. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> okay. So most of the mixers, at least in the U.S. law, are classified as unlicensed money services businesses. So they're not fully illegal by any means, but they are starting to be looked at as illicit services. Crypto enthusiasts will say that there are legitimate purposes for mixers. Some people just don't want their identity to be potentially known on the blockchain. But the amount of illicit funds that go through mixers, not just stolen funds, but you know, ransomware and all kinds of other illegal activity that you want to stop, mixers play a role in all of that. It's interesting, isn't it? There's a sort of philosophical defense of them. Of, well, the whole, the whole point of this is it's meant to be anonymous. Exactly. <laughs> and I know people that will put their funds through mixers before they, you know, pay for something on Amazon. <laughs> they just, they, they believe in the anonymous nature of cryptocurrency, but there is a need to stop the illicit activity that these mixers play a role in. It's at this point when the Qcoin funds are being jumbled up again and again through mixers that Aaron notices something very telling an important clue about who the hackers are. The funds are being sent through the mixers in very specific amounts before being moved around in a very familiar pattern. Erin's seen this pattern before in the work of one particular hacking gang, one she's come up against multiple times, the Lazarus Group. Anytime there is a hack of a, a crypto exchange, especially these days when North Korea has been so prolific, we sort of immediately start to at least try to rule them out as a suspect. Cryptocurrency is the cutting edge of money. Even people who've spent their lives in finance can struggle to get their heads around it. But yet again, the sophisticated hackers of the Lazarus Group are making stealing and laundering crypto look like child's play. North Korea has never admitted to any involvement in the Qcoin theft and has consistently denied any association with the Lazarus Group. The BBC approached the North Korean embassy in London for a response to the allegations raised in this season of the podcast. We never got a reply. But Erin's pretty confident that it's the Lazarus hackers who are behind the Qcoin heist. But can she claw any of the stolen crypto back? Well, at the end of this high-speed digital chase, she has lost sight of some of that $300 million haul. But not all of it. And she spotted something very interesting indeed. Some of the stolen Qcoin crypto is now sitting in a digital wallet that Erin and her colleagues already have their eyes on. Funds flowing from previous hacks that are known to be North Korea flowing from the Qcoin hack as well into the same deposit addresses. Right, OK. So effectively, if you've got one bank account and money from lots of different crimes goes into that one bank account, it's likely whoever owns that bank account committed all the crimes or is these benefiting from them all. That's exactly right, yeah. Erin can see the stolen funds, but she can't get at them. Crucially, cryptocurrency is decentralised. That means there's no banks or governments or authorities in charge of it. Unlike traditional bank accounts, the wallets controlled by these hackers are much, much harder to seize or get frozen by law enforcement. The hackers seem to have won. Except the hackers, remember, want to cash out the funds. It's no good stealing hundreds of millions of dollars of crypto if you can't spend it. If the North Korean regime wants to use it to buy components for bombs and missiles, or maybe even luxury items like Mercedes cars or Rolexes, for the most part, they're going to need old-fashioned money. And Aaron says the Lazarus Group's preferred currency to cash out into is Chinese Yuan. So the final hurdle for the hackers is to find a crypto exchange they can rely on to switch their stolen funds into, say, Yuan. Now, having listened to the Lazarus heist for as long as you have, it won't surprise you to learn that there are a lot of Wild West crypto exchanges out there where anything goes, no questions asked. Ultimately, Erin hopes that the hackers will mess up and send some of their illicit gains to an exchange that's more above board. And you quickly call them and say, these funds have hit your exchange, can you please freeze them? Um, while law enforcement processes the, the legal paperwork to actually get the funds back. Sometimes it works, Sometimes it doesn't. Aaron can see the stolen crypto sitting there in a wallet controlled by the hackers. And now it becomes a game of patience. And Aaron says the Lazarus Group hackers are very patient indeed. Their goal is to sit on, on the funds until there are no more eyes on the funds and then they'll start to cash them out. And then they'll typically sort of wait and they'll move a little bit 
and they'll kind of sit there for a bit and then they'll move up, you know, say um, 50 Bitcoin or, you know, some amount that if it gets seized, it's not oh, the, whole, <laughs> the whole package. So they're um, testing different escape routes for this. They and, do. And if the funds get stopped, they think, oh, that escape route hasn't worked. We'll try a different one. Yep. And then they'll go back through and, and try to obfuscate again. In the Qcoin case, Erin and her chain analysis colleagues were ultimately able to trace a lot of the funds to a helpful, reputable exchange. Who knows why exactly the Lazarus Group made the mistake of moving the funds there? Perhaps they thought they'd outfoxed her. Wrong. So the, the Qcoin funds, I, I believe it was about 80% that was returned. It was a significant retrieval, and it was through a service that ultimately complied and returned the funds to Qcoin. So we are having more and more success. But the Qcoin case is still an outlier. Aaron says it's still more likely that stolen crypto is never recovered. It's more likely that the funds go and disappear. And we should not forget that in Qcoin's case, sure, a lot was recovered, but 16% of the stolen money was lost. That's a whopping 45 and a half million US dollars, way more than the Lazarus Group made with their ATM jackpotting schemes and the Bank of Valletta hack put together. It's also worth mentioning that Qcoin was insured against losses like this. Unfortunately, they say no Qcoin customers lost any money. But $45 million goes a long way in North Korea. Plus, as we've said, this isn't the only crypto heist attributed to its hackers. In fact, if you add up the totals of all the crypto heists blamed on the Lazarus Group to date, as of when we recorded this, it comes to a jaw-dropping $3.2 billion. The North Korean hackers have earned way more from crypto than they ever got from traditional bank hacks. In fact, they're said to be responsible for the largest crypto theft ever recorded. In March 2022, North Korea's hackers were accused of targeting a popular online game called Axie Infinity. The crypto assets stolen were worth well over 600 million US dollars. And if you actually think about this in the dollar amount, some of this we put into dollars at the time the funds were stolen. So hacks that occurred in 2018 when the Bitcoin price was you know, $10,000 a Bitcoin is now worth so much more than that. At the time of recording this podcast, the value of Bitcoin is about $28,000 or thereabouts, but it fluctuates all the time. And this has now become part of the game of laundering this stuff, trying to cash out at the right time when the crypto market is peaking. It's mad to think that these hackers working for socialist North Korea are starting to become highly effective crypto speculators. Do we know how much is sort of left floating about in the cryptocurrency world, you know, in bits of wallets somewhere that, that they're struggling to cash out or they're waiting to cash out? Yeah, so we, we have eyes on all of their wallets that we know about, and about half of that right now is sitting in wallets that they haven't been able to cash out. And we have eyes on those at all times. <laughs> so as soon as they kind of try and do something with those wallets with that money in it, you're going to be all over them like a, like a bad rash, as they say. Yeah, we will aim to stop it. Our investigators have alerts set on all of them, so our investigators are going to know whether it's the middle of the night or you're at the family picnic. You'll often see stolen funds that are, are clawed back years after they've been stolen. US authorities are also looking for ways to tackle this theft. They've chosen to target cryptocurrency mixers. It's not possible just to take these mixers down. They're decentralized, meaning that no one person or commercial entity is in control of them. So the US government resorts to putting US Treasury sanctions on two mixers that are both very popular with the Lazarus Group, Blender, and Tornado Cash. After those sanctions came in, one of Tornado Cash's alleged developers was arrested in the Netherlands. He's currently awaiting trial. He's accused of facilitating money laundering and making large profits from the Lazarus Group's crimes. The second mixer, Blender, shut down pretty much immediately in the wake of US sanctions, or at least it appeared to. Crypto analysts claim it just rebranded and re-emerged under a new name, Sinbad. And Erin says that Sinbad is now the Lazarus Group's favorite crypto laundering service. Another crypto tracing firm says the group's already washed $100 million there. This will be a long cat and mouse game. And the Lazarus Group shows no sign of slowing down its targeting of the crypto world. And with billions of dollars up for grabs, it's clear the crypto market will continue to be their favorite hunting ground for some time yet. It's frightening to me to think about this hidden billion dollar crypto slush fund 
because I know where they're going to spend it. In recent years, despite strict UN sanctions, North Korea has still managed to get what it wants to build its nuclear weapons program. This is where investigators say that so much of these hacking proceeds, from the Bank of Bangladesh to Qcoin, are ending up. It's time to look at how Pyongyang spends its ill-gotten gains and meet the investigators who try to stop them. Nuclear programs are the most secret, most closely guarded things anywhere. I'm just like a regular lady that's never even set foot in North Korea, and I'm figuring it out. That's next time in the final episode of The Lazarus Heist. The Lazarus Heist is an original podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jeff White. And I'm Jean Lee. Our producer is Viv Jones. Our original music was composed by Magnus Fiennes and Ia Wu from the South Korean band Jambanai. Thanks, by the way, for all your messages about the series so far. We've really enjoyed reading them all. Do keep letting us know what you think, what's been your favourite bit, your favourite story. Let us know. And do leave us a rating and review. And tell all your friends about us, too. And don't forget to follow and subscribe so that you can hear next week's finale as soon as it drops. You can also spread the word on social media using the hashtag Lazarus Heist. Thanks for listening.